So I got the thumbs up from uh, Mr. McGuire. All right. We're getting the thumbs up from the control room. We're going to call the finance committee meeting to order. Uh, the roll call, uh, Michael Finnegan, I am here. And then we also have uh, Dr. McVeigh and Dr. Garrett, who are the other members of the committee. And then we have um, a whole variety of other board members and administration here at the table, um, waiting anxiously to hear what we're coming up with. So um, let us move right ahead into the five-year capital long-range plan, which I guess you have seen, well, some of you have not seen it ever. So um, others have seen previously. Is it Mr. Walhoff is going to cover this or Mr. Tracy? Uh, yeah, he's going to he's going to review that just for the new board members. Just a brief introduction. Uh, we have five. Uh, I'm sorry, we have two five year plans uh, that are presented uh, to the finance committee annually. Uh, the first, which is this evening, is the capital improvement five year plan, which deals strictly with our facilities. All funds that are used for these projects are out of our capital reserve fund, which is separate and its own entity from our general operating budget. Uh, so this is sort of an annual event. Mr. Wolhoff will run through the proposed projects for the next five years, and I'll turn it over to him. Next month, we'll have Dan McGuire doing the technology budget. Great, thank you, Mr. Tracy. So tonight, we're gonna to go over the long-range plans for Mary D, Kennett Middle School, Kennett High School, Bancroft, and New Garden and Greenwood. So at Mary D, for this upcoming year, we're proposing new uh, LED lighting in the hallways, as well as the classrooms, and painting the hallways. Um, and then we're looking to do new access controls at all of our buildings, there for our doors, um, our electronic card readers for our doors. Um, the new system will integrate with our camera system that we have with Mr. McGuire. So, you know, we'll be able to hone in on who's using the card. It might trigger the, the uh, camera system to you know, integrate and for safety and security reasons for that. So it's 29,000. I, I took the, the total cost and just divided it by the six buildings uh, there. So first year, um, it's $89,000 of what we're looking for improvements. 23-24 um, school year. We have two rooftop units left here, our HVAC units, two left to, to replace. Um, that's scheduled for the 23-24 school year, um, just over close to $340,000 um, for, for both of those units installed. And then um, we are looking to uh, paint the classrooms um, in a cycle, um, starting with um, two of the pods uh, that year, and then two of the pods the following year. For the new board members, um, we have uh, reached out to a roofing consultant um, about two years ago, and they came in and um, evaluated all of our roofing um, throughout the entire district um, and put together a very comprehensive roof plan for us um, with dollar amounts associated with that. So when you see in the plan roof sections, um, they come out of the um, the uh, roofing report. And I can share it with any new board member that may need it or old, old board members that, you know, may need it as well. Um, all in all, over the next three years, we're looking at about $670,000 in improvements for Mary D. Lang. Um, a lot of our buildings, not a lot, all of our buildings just about are, with the exception of New Garden and Greenwood, are in very, very good condition. So a lot of what, what you'll see is a lot of um, lighting improvements, painting, you know, just kind of cosmetic um, improvements, some infrastructure upgrades um, as we, we go to the other locations. So for Mary D. Lang, yes. um, is, so none of the work that's currently going on with, with the windows is included in this. That was separate. That was separate from right. Mr. Freenigan from last year. So okay. yes. And that the retaining wall and, and all that has been, been taken care of. And, and Mr. Wall, that, I just, I was looking at this and I know it's a five year long range plan. Does right. that mean that there's nothing necessarily well, planned for Mary D. Lang we, beyond those? No, we will. So part of what, what we're going to look at is um, through our architectural firm that's coming through um, in the next couple of months, they're going to be do a big feasibility study for the district. So you'll see more things next year um, upon their investigation and, and looking at things. So we will, we will push more, more things out. 
in Dr. McVeigh, usually these plans are, are planned out for five years, but on, on a year, year by year basis, we approve what's going to be done for that year, just in case things have to be added, removed, pushed forward, pushed back. Um, so it's not, it's not a hard schedule, but it's, uh, they're approved on a year by year basis. Okay. And, and, um, George, I know you're going to get into it. Is there anything in the 22, 23 calendar year that we're, you're going to get, and maybe you'll call those out as we go through the rest of the slide presentation that are new to the budget that hadn't been seen before? Um, I'm just, yeah. as you go through, just be nice to know, like, what's, what's, what have people sure. seen on this committee? And as a new person, like, what's new? The, yes. So, um, the new things are the are the lighting for for the schools, the new LED lighting, um, and the and the painting of the hallways for Mary D. Thank you. Um, Kennett Middle School um, outside building. Last year we did the parking lot lights. This year we're going to do the um, exterior lights around the outside of the building that are actually affixed to the building. Um, and last year we started our painting cycle there. So um, for the next three years, we'll be um, painting the classrooms over at, at there. That that's also was in, in last year's. Um, the sports facility bathrooms um, at the at the middle school. Upon my right before I arrived here, they did a new baseball field in the at the Kennett uh, Middle School in the back there. Um, there's no bathroom facilities back there. So we're we're putting a placeholder in just to explore the op option of potentially putting maybe one or two um, bathrooms out there uh, of boys and a male and a female bathroom out there or whatever the township may approve us for. Um, LED classroom lightings um, we did some last year as well, um, and this is just a cycle cycles through the buildings. Um, the sewer pumps, uh, they're coming up on their useful life uh, expectancy in the 24-25 school year. It's a placeholder in there, as, as Mr. Tracy said, we can push it out if, if the pumps are still good, but we just wanted to earmark, earmark it in there for that. Um, heat pumps in the classroom, we're spending a, a lot of money um, replacing heat pumps in the classrooms. They're, they're coming up on their, their end of their useful life. And um, this year we've probably put 10 units in there. Um, so we're earmarking money for um, replacement of um, the units for this year and next year over there. And it'll give us all new classroom um, uh, air conditioning units in there. So how many units does $28,000 get you? 28,000 will get you 10. So that's half of yeah. them? Okay. Half. And what's the lifespan of the heat pump units? 15. 15 years? years? Yes. And then the access control, as I said, stated earlier, um, upgraded to integrate with uh, Mr. McGuire's uh, camera system that he has in place there. And then pushing it out to 26, 27 school years is a boiler replacement. There's two boilers over there. Again, um, based upon its age and its useful, useful life, um, we're figuring 26, 27, but we can always push it out more. It just we take very good care of the, the boilers and all of our equipment. So it's just a placeholder in there for now. I know there's a lot of hot air coming out of some of the kids in the <laughs> as well. Uh, quick question, George, sure. on the bathrooms. Is that a separate structure? It is. A, it will be yeah. a separate structure, yes. Yes. Kent High School. Um, Last year we did the annex or the uh, aux gym on there. This year we're going to be, and this is this is in here um, from last year, um, the, the lighting and the painting. Um, gym bleachers are 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 newer to the to the budget. Um, they're wooden bleachers that are kind of falling falling apart and um, need to uh, be upgraded. So um, that's one hundred and twenty thousand for all new gym bleachers in there. So this summer we'll take the bleachers out, we'll paint everything, put the lights in, and new gym bleachers will, will be installed. And that will provide us ADA seating for the events as well. Our parking lot lights throughout the, that's the, the district office, the high school, um, and, and part of the stadium um, lighting, not the stadium lights, but you know some of the surrounding lights up there. 
um, is 53,000, and that's all LED um, lighting. The big one is the annex renovations, uh, 1.8 million for those. Um, we already received the bid, so that's an accurate, pretty accurate number uh, that we have in there. We opened up bids a few weeks ago, um, and it's a, it's roughly about 1.8 million dollars we'll be spending for the annex renovation. Um, LED lighting on the outside of the building. Um, that, like I said, they're, they're affixed to the actual building themselves. Um, all LED, any lighting that you see renovate are, will, will be all um, LED. And there's a lot of big rebates we get from Pico for that. So um, not only do we save operationally uh, for the future, but we also see some savings up front through some rebates that they give us. Um, VC2 tile on the first floor, um, if that's our ground level. It's not where the main office is, it's the ground level. We did the hallways over there um, two years ago before COVID, and then we did some of the classrooms last year. Um, it's because it's on concrete that you'll get um, the ease of starts to deteriorate and the tiles start to pop and things like that. So over the next two years, we'll finish that first floor out. Um, Stabilizing the walkway, and this is this has been in here um, in the budget as well. Um, if you notice, um, there's a sidewalk up against the uh, retaining wall along the front of the high school. That sidewalk has sunk down, and where the um, those that are up there for graduation, you'll notice the concrete by the flagpole and all has sunk down. So what we're going to do is take the concrete out and then. Um, tamp it all down. We've had it um, already inspected um, through our civil engineer and we know what's wrong. We're going to correct that and all new um, sidewalk goes back in. Uh, transportation roof is 18,000. We're incorporating that with the high school, or what, I'm sorry, with the annex renovations. So um, we just want to show you that the roof is, is also due for um, part, a section of the roof is, is due um, to be replaced. New front sign that's been on there. I'm going to work with Ms. Laws um, from our communications department. She is running a um, very successful rebranding uh, program for us. So uh, her and I will be meeting with a group of students and some other stakeholders to look at the front sign. It's, it's on the corner. Um, there's been talk about an LED sign. There's been talk about a solid, you know, just our letter signage. Um, so uh, she and I, like I said, we'll work with some stakeholders, some student groups and things like that and kind of come up with a sign um, that we can all agree upon that would be great for the, for the high school. Um, so she's doing a, a fantastic job with the rebranding of that, so. Uh, new guardrails going down the driveway. They're wooden guardrails, and they're just starting to deteriorate at the ground level. Um, so we're looking to put, <coughs> excuse me, new guardrails <coughs> down our driveway, main driveway coming uh, up from south to the high school. 23-24 school year, like I said, the tiles, um, another roof section in there, another roof section for our field house. Um, Legacy turf fields, uh, two years ago, we did the high school field, uh, turf field. Legacy turf field is, um, needs to be done. Um, we're, we're, it's costing us a, a lot of money and, and um, repairs over there. And for those that don't know about turf, there's something called GMAX testing, which we have to get tested every year. We get our, our um, turf tested, synthetic turf fields tested every year. Um, we're, we're okay with the GMAX test, um, but you can see over the last number of years, it's starting to go down um, as the GMAX rating for that. So um, we're looking to do uh, turf fields next uh, summer. Bathroom partitions in the bathroom. Um, high school, some of the kids are having fun in there with, uh, with putting stuff, not too, too bad, but um, you know, enough to um, you know, start to look at, at you know, redoing some of the, the, the partitions in there. 24-25 school year, 
that whole gamut of, of roof sections there for you know eight hundred thousand um, dollars, and then a boiler replacement for our field house as well. So we're looking at about five point five million over the next number of years for um, improvements to the high school. George, I don't know if this question is for you or for Nikki, but in the stakeholders, oh, she's here. Sorry, she's here. For this, in the stakeholders for the corner sign, are you um, pulling any of the alumni or the alumni association in with that, or just students? We, we can keep, go ahead. So we've talked about doing both the students, you know, some alumni um, folks as well. Miss um, Laws, I don't know. No. There we go. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Blakey. So I think um, what we would preferably do is model um, the precedent that we've started to set with our brand refresh committee. And so I think uh, Mr. Wolhoff mentioned that process. And once that is complete, we'll have a pretty good idea of where, um, where our task force would like us to go with the brand in general. But then certainly we would want to pull in all of our key stakeholder groups that would absolutely include alumni. But you know, we think of everyone from students to families to staff to, you know, local um, nonprofit and for-profit mm. partners to make sure that we really have the community on board with, with whatever decision we make. And, of course, members of the board as well. Yeah, I'm just thinking that that's something like the, you know, the signage for the school, there's a lot of legacy that goes into the school. So you have to get the feelings for the, you know, thousands of, of students who have gone through who, um, and not just the current ones. Sure. Not that they're not thinking straight currently, but... <laughs> George, can I, I have to have the same question. Um, is there anything in here that's that's relatively new that hasn't been on there before? Uh, or especially as it relates to the, the you know, the, the, work, thing, the work we're doing for the budget the in, only in this thing coming really up year. The new is the gym bleachers. Okay. Yeah. And <clears throat> I was just curious, legacy... Is is Legacy Field the only property that we generate revenue from renting it out of the properties that we own? And then how? And well, do we? I think we do collect rent on how we on do. that property. And then how does that what we collect from that work into these kind of figures when we have to, you know, we have to redo surfaces and, and do work over there? Yeah, I mean, so we do collect fees from all of our outside organizations. They're very, very minimal. They're really just to cover our cost of, you know, toilet paper, paper towels, soap, and things like that. I mean, you know, to rent a classroom, it's five dollars. To you know, to rent a, a field, it's it's either a hundred or seventy-five, depending upon what field you use. So, it it doesn't make a huge impact on on capital improvements. It's more of an operational um, budget, you know, just to try to have some skin in the game for the groups and, and, you know, just kind of recoup some of our costs when it comes to operational things such as, like I said, toilet paper, paper towels, the lighting. Um, we will be um, looking at our fee schedule as well as um, our 707 policy, which is our usage, um, just to make sure it's up to date. With the policy committee now that we have, we'll review 707 and I'll work with Mr. Tracy's office on making sure that, you know, we're good with the fee structure that we have set in place. Okay, thanks. And, and just to be clear, this what George is presenting is for the, the capital projects budget, which is separate funds than the general operating budget that we're doing next. So anything that changed in here is only affecting money that's already put away, not not the the, the budget that we're going to have that we're raising money through tax increases or not. Yeah, this money's already here marked, it's, you know, in there. So. George, the uh, based on the conversation, the front sign, that's a placeholder, it sounds like. That's correct. Yeah. Correct. I mean, we're just, you know, we're it's just a placeholder in there. Like, you know, Ms. Laws and I will we'll work on that and kind of come back with conceptual ideas. For the board to review, um, and, and yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. I mean, I, I admit that it kind of sticks out as wow, that's a heck of a sign. Yeah, we just, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, um, we just put that number in there. We did get mm -hmm. a number close to that for an actual sign out front there, but we kind of just wanted to take a pause and look and, and engage our stakeholders. There, there's, 
actually some reality in that science costs that much. There is some yeah. reality to that number. It's That's not just an arbitrary disappointing, number. Disappointing, <laughs> but okay. Um, the other question I have, I, I remember um, looking at the annex renovations, it, it seems like a long time ago now, 12 to 18 months, you know, but maybe it wasn't that long ago. Are, are the needs for the annex still the same, given where we are as a district and given you know new initiatives? Have we had reason to revisit um, the work that we want to do, or or the the structural, you know, the, the way the way the uh, renovations are being done? No, I mean, you know, right now the way it is is, you know, uh, Mr. McGuire's department is upstairs mm -hmm. with the students as well. The downstairs um, is more, you know, a work area for Mr. McGuire's group. Our goal with the renovation is try to get the students on the second floor for um, educational and then get Mr. McGuire's department on the first floor. So there's a kind of, you know, clear delineation mm -hmm. from students to, you know, an office mm -hmm. setting. So, um, but no, nothing that we're doing is, 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 is not needed, okay. you know, for that. Um, definitely, uh, it will be enhancements for both educational spaces and, and um, the tech team and the tech team themselves. So. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. If I could just add quickly, um, cause you got on the annex renovations, oh. the annex bids will be presented uh, next Monday evening for the board's approval, as well as any of the items that typically are over 25,000 requires to go up for public bid. So although we'll be asking you for approval of a capital reserve budget in June, which will really highlight year one of this plan, each of the large scale items will be presented to the board for their approval. So the annex went through the official bid, it was out on the market, it was duly advertised, we opened it at a public meeting a couple of weeks ago, we qualified all the bidders to make sure all the bid packets were complete, and then we're gonna make that recommendation to the board. So next Monday, you will see four contractors all related to that 1.8 million. You had previously approved Bernardin's contract for architectural services for that same project. Uh, there are some items that may be exempt for that. Uh, the sidewalk project for 350 will be a bidded project. The sign, some of the avenues that we have available to us are co-star. So if we can find some avenues that will provide us the opportunity to use a governmental entity cooperative program, we could use that. So we can use some of that for small grade roofing projects, the sign happened to be a vendor that we did find. Legacy fields will be bid. So we'll go through and bring in Architera, the original architect. We'll have a contract with that individual and his firm. And then we'll go out to bid. A very, you know, the bid packets are very, very complex, yes. very detailed. Uh, but we do that for all of our public bidding projects. So tonight, and even when you approve the budget, isn't the final say, especially on the big items. The board will see if the annex project would have came in significantly over budget. You know, either we wouldn't have recommended it for board approval or the board could revisit that and actually not award any of the bids. And we did that with the high school steps the first time. Correct. High school steps the first time we bid, it came in significantly higher. It was almost 600000 less the second time we opened bids on that project. So there is a lot more opportunity for board discretion and approvals. Uh, really what you're saying, George does have a lot of detailed work to support these numbers. They're, yes. not, they're not just guesstimates. I mean, he's, he's met with architects, he's met with engineers and contractors to at least give us reasonable and reliable ballpark numbers. Sorry, George. Oh, you're fine. Bancroft, it's a, a, the, the newest school. Um, you know, we really want to look at power washing the outside of there. Um, the, uh, the access control integra integration um, will, will be this coming summer. Um, hallway lighting, LED lighting, they, they do, even though it's new, it's, it's the old fluorescent bulbs. Um, so the MUA M, uh, is makeup um, air unit. So um, it's $575,000. So this is an HVAC component to um, the system over there. So a number of years ago, we had an issue with, uh, with mold at the school. Um, and we had to have it all remediated outside of the HVAC units. Um, so the makeup air unit is um, conditions the air coming in to help prevent the humidity levels from exceeding the dew point and causing mold to grow. So um, we had engineers involved. We had, you know, different type of mechanical engineers looking at it, HVAC experts, and they suggested a makeup air unit um, 
three of them in, in over there to um, help with the indoor air quality of that school. So that's proposed for the 23-24 school year. The sewer ejector pump over there is $18,000. It is just a placeholder for, um, you know, its useful life is, is winding down. So we have a placeholder number in there to change out the sewage ejector pump if we need to do it. Um, it could slide over if we have to. Um, LED lighting um, in the classrooms pushed out to the 24-25 school year with about $670,000 in improvements over the next few years at Bank. George? Yes. So on the power washing, I, I noticed you didn't have it at the high school. When was the last time that was done? The front was done three years ago, um, I believe. Um, and the stadium was done last year, the stadium itself. But the front of the high school was done. Really? Yeah. yeah wow. It was done it, about it's, two or three years ago. It kind of... Yeah. It yeah. kind of gets bad again real quick. It does, it? just the, the street and stuff with the limestone. So oh, okay. We'll get it. We'll get that. All righty. Just curious on yeah. that one. Thank you. The district office. The district office. Uh, sidewalk, as soon as you come in, you'll see it's starting to spall and crack up, up in the front there. Um, so, you know, we're looking to get the new um, sidewalk replaced. It's painting inside the annex or the uh, district office and, you know, seal coating and striping the um, front DO parking lot as well as Legacy's parking lot is, is in that number as well. So Legacy gets seal coated and striped as well as um, the district office as uh, there. Um, the following year, 23-24, new roof on the, on the district office, all new gutters around the outside. Um, over the next two years or so, we'll be around $77,000 in improvements for the annex. And then this is this is the budget this is the breakdown um, that Mr. Tracy puts together. Um, so for for year one, 22-23, um, we're about $2.9 million in, in, in upgrades to to the uh, to the district. Following year, 3.1, 999 or 944,000 in year three. Year four, about 445,000. Altogether, about 7.5, 7.4 million dollars in renovations over the next four years. So New Garden in Greenwood, it doesn't include New Garden in Greenwood. Um, you know, we, se we secured Breslin Architects. Um, we do have to do access controls there as well um, over the, for the next couple of years, but we can use the panels and the, either the renovations or the new part. So the backbone will not be wasted um, for that. Uh, Greenwood Elementary, they're actually installing a new eight inch water main. Um, they started a few weeks ago. They started digging up um, route one there on, on the shoulder, right by Longwood um, exit ramp to get, get off there. So they started digging that up and they're, they were starting to put pipe in there today. So that's going to take a new eight inch public water main down to um, Greenwood Elementary School. And then we will, we will stop it there and then decide um, how long the Greenwood renovations are going to take or building there. And then we can decide whether we want to take it in now or we want to just kind of hold off for a couple of years. But, um, Going down, it's it's it will be installed over the next you know month or so, and we'll have public water down to the front. We get a we, we'll get a fire hydrant out front there. Um, the way we have it kind of structured with um, Chester Water Authority is if anybody taps into that water main, we get reimbursed a, a tapping fee um, for that, which is good because I'm sure with the well situation over there and people running low on their wells and stuff, they probably will start jumping in on public water. Um, while we're on New Garden and Greenwood, um, we put an RFP out for construction management uh, last Friday to, um, to three firms. Um, we're, I'll be walking through one of them this Friday through the schools and hopefully have um, a decision made here in the next couple months on the construction manager. 
Um, we will have a meeting on February 16th with our steering committee um, for, for, for that um, with Breslin Architects to look at um, just starting to get the ball moving on the new project. So Breslin is performing a district-wide feasibility study. So part of the construction pro process in the state of Pennsylvania is you have to go through what they call plan con. Even though it's kind of dead in the water. So plan con, we get cents back on the dollar for everything construction related that for new and rent. You have to meet a certain threshold for dollars, but we get um, we get reimbursed back for some of that. And it's very, very minimum, but it's cents on the dollar. But part of that, we have to provide them a district-wide feasibility study of the conditions of all of our buildings. Um, that's what I said earlier when, you know, some of these things aren't broken out real far. It's because we're waiting to see what the feasibility study says um, as we fill these columns out over the next couple of years um, based upon their feasibility study. They'll do mechanical. They'll do electrical. They'll do space needs for, for their... Um, all those kind of things um, come into play there. Um, Pennsylvania State Police, they're auditing all of our facilities. They actually started at the high school a few weeks ago. Um, we'll be getting a comprehensive report back with the best practices and any kind of improvement suggestions that they have re regarding safety and security. So they'll, they'll, you'll start to maybe see some of those in the, in the budget, depending upon the dollar value of, of those improvements. Um, the biggest one driving the facilities is um, our strategic goals and our comprehensive plan. So we want to make sure that what we have here, um, our goals and our comprehensive plan, the educational model that's spelled out in there, our facilities can relate to that. Whether it's more space in the buildings, more breakout space, more flexible space, making sure that we're use, utilizing the space correctly for our education process. What we did do last week was we had the architect go through the high school and do a space utilization over there because of the new pathways programs that are going over there and making sure that, you know, we're using our space properly and, and identify any underused or undersized spaces and we can make corrections. So next year's, plan will be much more robust in nature with a lot of these component pieces being implemented in there. Um, but for this year, you know, we, we went out to, you know, the three, sometimes four years, but it'll be much more robust with, with all this information and data that we'll have from uh, all three of these. So that. That's it. Right, thank you, George. Um, Semi-related question. When we built Bancroft, we had to run the sewer line, and if anyone tapped into it, um, we were supposed to get um, money back. Did anyone ever tap into that over there? I don't believe they did. No. Not that I'm aware of. I, I don't think of any new construction around that area because there there's the trailer parks and things over yeah. there. So, But I, I do agree with you that I think that we'll get people tapping into the water line. Oh, the water, yeah, more, than the, more yeah. so than the sewer. Great, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Wilhoff. George? I'm sorry, can I ask sure. a couple of questions? Yeah, sure, okay. um, the state police audit, is that a regular audit that they do? It's not man it's not mandatory. Um so we 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 did it on our own to bring them in mm -hmm. to, to look at it. Um they have a specialized unit that that's what they do, school security. Really? So um I invited them in mm -hmm. and uh, they came to the high school and then they'll be doing the other buildings. But they check they check out, and he was here for hours, you know, going through, which was great. You know, he's a different set of eyes from a law enforcement mm -hmm. um, perspective. Mr. McGuire and I do meet every other month with our local law enforcement agencies, and we do have a, a committee of, of folks that we have together internally that we work with for safety and security. But, you know, we just thought it would be a great idea to bring the state police in and walk those guys It's interesting to me that they have a, a unit they, dedicated yes, to, to school yeah. security. I mean, normally you don't think of police as being experts in educational. Yeah. It's more, you know, facilities, you know, mm -hmm. you look at the entire facilities and best practices and things like that. So a lot of great, great information. And, you know, obviously I'll share, share the reports with the board. So. Thank you. Yes. I remember, I think we had that done after Sandy Hook, or at least since then. I remember one of the 
recommendations was the external numberings of, of doors yeah. so that when someone reports, um, you know, they know, go to a certain door. Yeah. Uh, and now I start to see that, you know, in schools all over the place. So that's um, something you don't think about until, you know, if you're a, uh, an emergency group showing up, it's like, where do I go? Yeah, just one one piece that they had was like the loop handles on the pull doors outside. Mm -hmm. Just taking one of them off because you can chain them together. So like just things like that. Yeah, like it was don't very kind beneficial. Of think about you know you just take for granted like you're mm -hmm. looking at the. So you know there's all those kind of recommendations that are in there for best practice. It's definitely worthwhile. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Wilhelm. Now we move along to the for a first look at the preliminary general operating budget, and I know this will be Mr. Tracy. And everyone did get copies of this with board docs. And the members of the public can follow along. Okay, thank you, Mr. Finnegan. We'll try to keep it light over the next 32 slides. Uh, certainly, if you have any questions uh, as we go through, uh, I'd like it to be a more interactive discussion. Um, and before we get started, I wanted to give a quick birthday shout out to sort of my right hand in the finance department, Penny Schaefer, who could not be with us this evening but it was her birthday, and since she is absent, I didn't bring you the cupcakes, but that's how we were gonna start the meeting. Um, we're gonna start off by uh, just giving a brief introduction to the preliminary budget. There are three budgets that the board is gonna be asked to approve in the next five months. Uh, the first will be the preliminary budget. The preliminary budget uh, really represents the public display. So at that time, we're actually gonna ask the board next Monday evening to approve a preliminary budget. Uh, it'll be posted on our website. And then for the next four to five months, we're going to really be debating uh, you know, the pros and cons of the budget. And things will certainly evolve. Hopefully, they'll evolve for the better, meaning lower the proposed tax increase as we get closer and closer to that final approval in June. There is an interim step. We'll do a proposed final budget in April. Uh, this is all part of the Act 1 legislation requiring various steps Many of them are required if you're going to exceed the index. Uh, this year, I can tell you right from the beginning, we are not uh, going to be exceeding the index. So it makes a lot of the regulatory benchmarks uh, somewhat mute, so we don't really have to worry about them. However, we always prepare ourselves in the event that if we need the referendum exception, we are poised and ready to access them. There are only two exceptions left. One is for our retirement. So if our retirement increase was over the index, most likely we would qualify for a actual budget exception. The other one is for special education. Um, but once again, you're looking at increases in various special education codes that exceed the 3.4%. So since we really don't need to address those this year, we'll save that educational lesson for some other date. Hopefully never, but it may come up again. Uh, with that said, we'll start with the where we're at right now. This is our budget timeline. Uh, we present the next several every month as we get through our finance committee meetings. So we'll start at this point. You heard from Mr. Woolhoff. Uh, once again, that has no immediate budget implication. Uh, we had about $20 million sitting in our capital reserve fund. Uh, he proposed a spend of about 7 million, a little shy of that. We also spent about 3 million this year. So over the next five years, we're looking at drawing down about 10 million. That's not saying we won't try to replenish it. And there's something that we're gonna talk about in our preliminary budget to add some funds back into that. Um, I will be delivering the proposed uh, preliminary budget this evening, and it will be up for your board approval next Monday. Uh, some of the key things that we're gonna be looking at, March is a big one. Uh, Mr. McGuire will be presenting our technology plan. He has things that affect our capital budget as well as things that are integrated into our general operating budget. So his presentation will impact both. Um, any recommendations he had for this year are incorporated into our preliminary budget. One of the big items in March, we're going to be looking at the Commonwealth budget. As you know, the Act 1 timeline doesn't sync real well with governmental approvals, letting us know what we're getting from our partner in education, the state. Uh, we do rely on a hefty sum, 16 so percent of our budget is state funded. We do a preliminary budget without any knowledge of what that state budget looks like. So the governor will be coming out with his budget. We're going to talk a little bit about that later on the presentation. But we'll get some new numbers if we receive extra revenue or proposed new revenue from the state. We will incorporate that into our budget for that proposed final budget in April, lowering our proposed tax increase. So there are some of the mechanics that we'll be looking at over the next couple of months. And then we really have plenty of meetings, April, May, and June, Finance Committee meetings, really, and we're opening that up for board discussion. If the board has questions, I encourage you 
to contact Mr. Finnegan, send your thoughts, send your questions to him. Certainly you can reach out to me individually, but if you'd like them to be known in a public form, please contact Mr. Finnegan. We'll add them to the agenda. We've done charter schools. We've drilled down on special education. And at that time, it really allows me to reach out to the experts in the field. So Dr. Collins could be here if it's dealing with personnel. You know, we'll bring uh, Dr. Cellini here if it's dealing with instructional programs, certainly. You know, we have Dr. Blakey here. So we can really drill down to the, what the board has concerns with and questions they have in the budget rather than me just doing one-way presentations. We're gonna jump right into sort of the discussion this evening. Right now we sit with a proposed tax increase of 2.03%, uh, which represents 32.5147 mills. We could do a lot of community education on what is a mill because most people really don't have an understanding. They wait for that tax notification to come out. They look for percentages. So it's been my practice to always speak about tax increases as a percent. We'll break it down to an average increase per household, but really it's what's pertinent to you. So if you're living in a house that is valued at 600,000, that number is gonna be significantly north of our average. If you're living in a house that has a significant lower value, it's also gonna be less than the average. So 2.3% seems to be the barometer that the community wants to hear. What will my taxes be going up? But millage rates being one thousandth of your assessed valuation doesn't seem to correlate a lot to people's understanding of what they receive as far as a tax notification. Appropriation of fund balance, um, we sit on about 8% of our general operating budget, so about $7 million that we sit unreserved, undesignated is the terminology, meaning that is sort of your savings account. There's been times when just to lessen the tax burden in one year, we'll pull money out and allocate it to offset some of the tax increases for this current year. So that is always an option of the board. We maintain 8%. Uh, we've done an outstanding job trying to maintain it. We've had a couple of years where it's dipped a little bit less. We never go over that 8%, and there's a reason why. It's not that we are so accurate with our budget. We transfer any excess into the capital reserve to maintain that 8%. Uh, the budget deliberations, as I mentioned, the but, next one. Mr. Tracy, on the appropriation, sure. just for the new board members, that if for the times that we did appropriate funds from the fund balance, the following year, you're automatically down by that amount. So um, you're, you realize that you, you want to try to not do it. So if you, we pulled 120000 down, and next year's budget's automatically down 120000 So something you want to use sparingly. Sorry, go ahead, Mr. Tracy. Uh, thank you, Mike. All right, so we have, I mentioned the uh, March 7th meeting. All of our meetings are open to the public, so we encourage them to come. They also can raise questions at our board meetings. Uh, the governor's budget is slated for February the 8th. It'll take about a day or two for all of the very general allocations. You know, you'll hear the budget allocation for education is up 3%. What that means to Kennett will take a few days for it to come out of all the financial houses. And then eventually we'll see list of appropriations for every single school district in the Commonwealth. And we'll just clip those out quickly and we'll have those ready for the March 7th meeting and let you know what that budget impact is. Um, and we're gonna go through what subsidies really we receive from the state a little bit later. As I mentioned, our Act 1 index was a 3.4%. It's considered unmodified, which means we are in the bulk of the state. If we were, in the eyes of the state, a poorer district, then that number would be north of that. So we'd be able to raise taxes over 3.4%. In Chester County, uh, we've hit it once where we're actually on the fringe. We're always on that fringe of being considered a school that may have it modified or not. This year we did not, so we got the base index. So 3.4 is the same of the Westchesters, the TEs, you know, the Lower Marians, all the very wealthy schools, uh, schools a little bit west of us, Oxford, Avangrove, Coatesville, Octor all get modded rates, which will allow them to raise taxes over 3.4 without necessarily going for a referendum or an exemption. So you're gonna hear some different numbers as you're reading the local papers that Oxford may be able to go to 4% without getting a referendum or an exception. And that's the case. So if you're interested in it, I can break that down and show you what all the school districts have. It's a public number. Um, no referendums are required because we're less than index. What's that look like? Once again, I said, here's the mills. Doesn't mean a lot to, you know, many people. It takes me a little bit of time, even when I look at my own assessment to calculate for my private residential property. But 
you know, ultimately the board will be approving a tax resolution which includes setting the millage. Your assessed valuation on your house is set by the county. So that's a county number. There's two equations. One, you need that assessment. The second piece of driving your tax bill is the millage rate. So you take your assessment, divide it by 1,000, times it by the millage rate that this board sets. That's how you calculate your taxes. So one component of it we do have in our control, and that's the millage rate. What does it look like for our average residential um, property owner? Right now it would be $117 based upon the proposed tax increase. All right, that's a property roughly a little over $300,000 per year. It's really changed lately because of the inflation of the residential housing market. Um, but remember, the housing market doesn't change our tax base. That, you know, 30, 40 percent that you've maybe recognized in your residential property doesn't equate to any change in your assessed value. So we're still working with a fixed base. It is not market driven. It was set in 1997 and it gets scaled back to that every time they assess a house. So a house that's assessed at, or I'm sorry, a house that has a value of 500,000, there's a common level ratio that brings that back down to 1997. So it's a little less than 50 percent right now. We'll bring it back to that number. There's no direct correlation to market value to assessed. There should be. It just doesn't work that way. Any questions on the... Uh, or drill down to some expenditures. There's a lot of information in this PowerPoint. Like I said, just, just please try to digest some of it. Uh, you know, Mr. Finnegan has been with us now for... 14 years? 14 years. 14 years. You know, you absorb it over time. It's, it's some of our areas especially, not everybody's. But, you know, don't hesitate to ask a question. This is what it looks like. Uh, one of the things we're going to talk about, the salaries and benefits right now are sort of in flux. So we talked about some of the estimates that Mr. Woolhoff used. It's very similar to what we're using this year in the budget because the bulk of our salaries reside on our collective bargaining unit with the teachers, which after June 30th of this year doesn't exist. So there are some numbers right now that if this board said, Mark, exactly where did you get that number to? I'm using the best information I have at hand, but it's not an exact science at this time. As we move closer, if certainly if we have a settlement in that agreement, I can bring a lot more accuracy to this number. But salaries always takes the biggest chunk. I mean, you're seeing a lot of growth in benefits with the PCERS rate, but you know, when you look at that, it's easy to identify where labor intensive industry. There's other components, but there's labor intensive. Some of the other areas that really have grown are professional services. That green section, that is almost exclusively special education services through the intermediate unit. There's a couple other aspects that get thrown in there. We refer to salaries as 100, benefits to 200, contract professional services as 300. That's all prescribed by the state's accounting methodology. So that, that's how we identify with them. Um, contracted services has grown over the years as we contracted out transportation in 2006 to Craft Bus Company. That's a $4.5, $4.6 million contract that moved from salaries and benefits here to contracted services. Uh, the same happened with the paraprofessionals, the instructional assistants. When they were transferred, they went from employee salary benefits category to contracted service. Um, the other thing that falls into the contracted services is some of our educational, it's tuition for charter schools. So that's another area that gets picked up in there. So, You'll get more familiar as we start defining what's in each one of these categories, but there's some of the major categories as broken down by the state accounting system. Here's what it looks like percent-wise. You know, when you really look at that, there's 60% salaries and benefits. That is something when you talk to the state is local control. So many years ago when you had sort of very high tax increases, the state was pushing back on school boards saying you have local control this is exactly what they mean because salary and benefits are locally negotiated per educational entity. All right, so we're not Westchester, we're not the IU. We have the power within Kennett to negotiate our own contracts for our labor force. You can see debt. I just wanted to point that out, that 9% section of debt. Debt's in two categories, interest and principal. Very similar to a mortgage, very similar to a car payment. Ours is much larger, but it, it works in the same fashion. We have a 20-year municipal bond that we float out there and we pay it off over the series. That number staying at 9%, although our debt has gotten significantly less, and we've talked about being able to finance New Garden and Greenwood 
without really a tax implication. Our strategy is to hold that 9%. Debt's starting to fall off, so we could go to 8%, 7%. In five years, we'd be down to 2%, and then, you know, really down to zero. And we're going to fold some debt in, so that 9% now will continue on longer and longer as we define the scope, whether it's a $60 million project or 80, just defines the duration, whether it's going to be 14, 15, or 16 years longer. But that 9% should remain consistent. We always come up with budget um, foundations. This is really where we start. Uh, we have a collective bargaining agreement, as I mentioned, with the Kennett Education Association. It, it is key as far as formulating our budget for next year. I mentioned this back in, I think it was December at our finance committee meeting. We are very unique at Kennett. We roll salaries and benefits by person. So, it, you know, we'll take a look at every individual. We just don't do aggregate rollovers. Hey, salaries are going to be 4%. We take, you know, Mark Tracy, we identify his salary. We take a look at uh, Social Security, the retirement, those things that are driven all salary percentage-wise. We'll look at my uh, medical care, whether it's family, single, family independence, and we'll actually budget each one of those line items. I mean, it's a sophisticated system that does it. We're not doing that by hand, but it's literally thousands of items drilled down to an individual so that if the board were to ask, how much is it costing for an addition of a tech individual we could pull that right out and give you not only the salary but the full cost of employment for that individual so it's it's a very detailed process once once again we haven't solidified a successor agreement which makes us have a little bit of you know guesswork in, in building this budget um, act 93 agreement uh, that is your administrators with the exception of the superintendent assistant superintendent and myself but does cover all building level and central office level administrators uh, their contract expires as well June 30th. Uh, we have received receipt that they would like to meet with the board and have a meet and discuss session. So we'll be proceeding through that, and I do expect that to be concluded prior to our budget adoption. Uh, all other classifications, we do have other areas that are not defined by contracts. Uh, they would be all of our typically support personnel. Uh, that's administrative assistants. That's maintenance custodial workers. Um, there's a couple other there's speech therapists, so we have a lot of other positions that fall in these undesignated categories. Uh, we've budgeted them at 4% at a maximum. We're going to cover the new positions. There are five new positions, and we're going to talk a little bit about the funding streams for them a little bit later. Uh, one new contracted position, I believe it would be coming through the IU. Uh, at this point in time, we haven't built in any retirements. Uh, that's important because as retirements come in to Dr. Barber and Dr. Salini, we can capitalize on some savings if they're not being repurposed into another position. So an individual who retires on the higher end of our salary schedule, you know, 104, 98,000, and we replace that with a less senior um, teaching staff comes in at 63, we can capitalize on some savings. But at this point in time, we're not forecasting any retirements, but we'll build some of those in before we hit the final budget, and no furloughs or outsourcing, meaning we haven't designated any individuals to be uh, laid off at this time. Moving on to uh, some of our benefit uh, foundations. Uh, the medical, we had our first look. We uh, hired the Raschini Group. We are self-insured for medical prescription and dental. Uh, we use a third party. Uh, administrator, they are a Skeeny group. Uh, they also have about six other districts in Chester County uh, that utilize their services. Uh, they take a look at all of our claims that are paid out in the last 18 months, and they do trend analysis, and we forecast it based upon that. So our renewal for medical without changing our plan design, like I said, if there's a plan design that's negotiated, that's not incorporated into this. So we're looking at our plan that we currently have today with the co-payments and employee co-share. Uh, for our medical, 9.46%. The actual budget's a little bit different. That has to do with transitions within who is taking single family in our open enrollment period. So there's other things that are really playing into this other than just rolling, you know, a perfect family to family, single to single. Someone, you know, has a baby and they're married, and then we end up with the family covered instead of husband and wife. So there are those type of implications. A uh, prescription, we've really had some... Um, great success in negotiating contracts uh, through the 
IBX network uh, where we do purchase that. So we've been seeing significant rebates and discounts uh, on our pharmaceutical end. So it's the second year in a row that we've actually seen a decrease in our overall experience with prescription. You can see this one has a much better correlation to the actual premium reduction as it into the budget of a little over 6%. Uh, the employee retirement contribution rate is set for any employee that works 500 hours or more. It's a mandatory program. Uh, so there's two parts to this. The rate is certified at 35.26. We do have a slide. So those that got a little head in the slide deck saw a nice curve going up. It is starting to level in this 35, 36% range. We will get half of that back you know, from the state uh, in 2001-2. There was a fully funded pension system. The only thing they were actually charging back then was a small fee for the medical piece uh, that is offered to our uh, retired employees. Uh, so it's a, compared to past years, it's a minor increase. It is an increase nonetheless of 0.9%. Uh, uh, vision life um, disability, there's really not a lot. We take a look at our, our trending because the benefits haven't changed in those programs since our last collective bargaining agreement, which is now almost six years old. We don't see a great cost increase. And for example, dental's capped out at 2,000. So individuals that hit last year 2,000 are going to hit it again this year, depending upon their dental work. Um, you know, they're all really relatively flat for the last couple of years. Workers' compensation, other than some fraudulent claims that everybody's dealing with these days, coming through workers' comp, our workers' comp has been really low, and some of that is the success of our. Uh, safety and security program that George and Dan work with because we do follow up with any accident. You know, now we're big into documenting. Uh, we have a self-insured program with about 66 other districts in, in the Commonwealth to operate this. So our mod rate is very low. So not a lot to really highlight as far as workers comp. New positions, uh, we have a couple of them. Some of them were integrated this year in transitions. Uh, we have a middle school and high school special education coach. They were moved uh, in this year's budget, and they're going to now be, they were sort of teachers on assignment, and it looks like we're going to be bringing this in as full-time positions. So there's no real budgetary impact. It's just a transition of identifying one teacher and moving them to another. One was elementary. I think the other one was middle school. Um, so these would be more permanentized positions. Uh, the proposed positions, which are new, a uh, supervisor of elementary education, uh, the impact isn't a full value of an employee because we'd be looking at a transitioning of an employee. Um, that person has not been designated yet, but class size reduction potentially at the elementary school, meaning the entire class enrollment has gone down. We would have a unit down the elementary that then we could really save the funds there and direct it towards this position. So we're hopefully having a minimal increase of new salary and benefits to cover this position. Uh, two LED teachers, uh, one is going to be funded out of our ESSERS grant, um, which is really a viable solution for the next two years. Uh, hopefully we'll get an extension right now. The deadline is September of 2024. I think there's going to be a lot of districts that are sitting on money come 2024. So hopefully they'll do some type of extension so we may be able to buy it another year being funded out of that program. Uh, what will impact you is the second one at about $140,000. That is really the going rate now of a new hire. You're not hiring at the very low end of the salary schedule. We're typically looking at step three or four, especially when you get to ELD, special education, hard to fill position. So we're bringing people in at about 70,000 on average. Uh, you put some benefits on it and suddenly equals 140,000. Uh, we do have some supplemental contracts. Um, these are currently being negotiated. I just put a placeholder on them. Um, just in case. So they, they may or may not be there at the final passage of the budget in June. And that's all the new positions. Everything else is 319.25 teachers rolling over. We have about 22 administrators that will be rolling over and many substitute, I mean, uh, clerical custodial maintenance positions that also rolled. What is new is a capital reserve transfer. As I mentioned, right now, the only way that we fund the capital reserve, there used to be a line item way back when of money that you actually designate. The only way to get to move from the general operating budget to the capital reserve budget is a transfer. The capital reserve budget's only source of income is through that transfer. 
So it doesn't have taxing authority. It generates a little bit of interest, but other than that takes a dedicated effort or line item that actually puts money into that account. So we, for the first time in decades, have put half a million dollars back in to fund many of the projects that Mr. Wolhoff had mentioned. Uh, transportation budget, we do have a contract with the Craft Bus Company. It has a minimum of a 2% increase or CPIU um, for the calendar year with a max of 5%. I don't expect that we're going to hit that CPI, so I put in a 2% increase on their contract for next year. Uh, if inflation catches up with us, at least we do have that maximum not to exceed number of 5% in our contract. Uh, but this is an ongoing cost associated with or transportation operation. The board certified behavioral analyst, this is the one contracted position that I mentioned uh, that we're looking at contracting in to provide services. I believe that is district wide uh, through Chester County Intermediate Unit. Uh, utilities, um, I think anybody that's been to the gas pump lately recognizes that cost of energy and energy products are on the increase. So, you know, all these numbers look very large, but so is our volume. Our utilization is very large. So we're looking at about a $95,000 increase in utilities. Uh, technology equipment and the very last item, the facility improvements. These are two items that we are going, and we've been trying to restore budgets both in technology and in facilities that allow them to handle smaller scale projects in-house. We stripped all these budget codes back in the residential housing market crisis. So when our budget was being cut, actually being reduced year to year, we had really taken them down to where everything that we tried to do was coming out of capital reserve. So this may be year number four or five that we've actually been taking and putting 50,000 in technology, 25,000 into uh, Georgia's budget in the capital. So they can handle some painting, they can handle light replacements without have to putting it on a five-year plan. And for the technology budget, and you'll see this with Dan, there's a lot when you're turning a one-to-one -one program as well as staff laptops. And we are probably about two years away from him being able to handle that full replenishment cost within our general operating budget. And finally, legal services are up. I mean, they are, you know, this includes everything from our due process hearings. It includes our general solicitor. It includes employment practices, but legal is, is very expensive. Some of that has to do with uh, some things, initiatives that we've actually invoked on them, such as our tax assessment appeals, which are providing rewards on the revenue side that offset that cost. Okay, building allocations, we covered this very early on in the building. Each one of our buildings gets allocated a sum of money for consumable products in their building. It is based on their enrollment times a weighted factor. So the high school gets more per student than does the kindergarten center, but it is driven out based upon their enrollment. So Bancroft may or may not get more money than last year because even though their, their weighted cost goes up by the index, if their enrollment went down a lot big enough, or if their enrollment dropped, they're gonna get less money for their building. So each one of the building principals has a budget, which then they designate either by department, grade level, and they have control of how they spend that money. What's been taken out of that budget from years ago are technology and district-wide uh, curriculum initiatives. So they receive that money. It's site-based management. They really go through the process, and we just make sure that it's managed in according to our accounting principles. Same thing with departments. Um, special education, uh, that takes a lot of time. Uh, we get estimates from our special education department in-house. We also get estimates based on our enrollment from last year, I'm sorry, for our current year is what we use for enrollment. So the IU, Devro, Timothy School, they all have tuition rates this year. We know where the students are. So we just take that and we know that the IU just had their proposed budgets coming out and we'll just take at times all the new tuition rates. And they, they provide us, the IU is great at providing us with budget forecasts for next year. What we don't know is how many kids will come and go over the next six, seven months. Uh, so that's a little bit of a wild card, but, but it's as accurate as we can be at the time. We already mentioned uh, student transportation, occupational education, the vocational schools. There is a formula for that. It's actually a known number when we hit the budget. So that number that we have in this budget is dead on. It will be perfect because they're looking at a historical cost figure. Three years enrollment times their tuition rate. It's three years average times their tuition rate. 
you know, so we've actually had a decrease in students that we're sending uh, to occupational education in the last year. So that's actually reflecting in a, in a deduction or reduction in our overall cost for that program. Uh, paraprofessionals, we are tied to the Act 1 index uh, with CRESS. Uh, charter school tuition, we presented this at the last one. I do have a chart in here uh, that we'll cover a little bit later, but it is our, our current enrollment times our tuition rate, which is based upon our budgeted expenses. And we just increased that by Act 1. We have less kids going to the charter school. Um, it's less kids than we've ever had, I think, since the opening of Avon Grove Charter School. So it's a decrease of 200,000. But you got to remember now, a special education students north of 30,000. So it doesn't take many kids to make that delta of 200,000 appear. And as I mentioned before, no new debt. Now, unless there's some specific questions related, there's a lot of numbers going to come up on the screen. You know, I could pretty much bore you to tears walking through all of them. But I, I really just wanted to highlight some of the changes, as I mentioned. You know, salaries would be closer to the index that 3.4 to 3.8 however just the addition of several new staffing increased it to a 4.61 uh, as i mentioned you know when we look at employee benefits that does include the increase and we're going to take a look at that on the next slide where it really drills down to where our medical increases are coming from but overall there's not one area with the exception of other financing uses that really jumps off the page at, at me as being abnormal and that's really that 500,000 that we kicked in for that capital reserve transfer. So if you remove that, that number would be 200,000. It really is not immaterial, but certainly insignificant when you're looking at a 90 plus million dollar budget. Uh, so we're gonna take a look at the benefits because that is the biggest number up on the chart after salaries. So this really just kind of breaks down the various levels of expenses, tries to point out any type of differences. I mentioned uh, the new positions, you know, are adding to that overall salary increase. I was a little bit light when I spoke, so it's 2.7% on our rollover, and then another 523,000 on new. Uh, the benefits, just remember when you look at that retirement number, we're always getting back half. So although it illustrates 1.3 million, you know, I mean, it's it's gonna be, I'm sorry, 645,000. It's only 320,000 is the net impact to the district. Uh, healthcare insurance, uh, I'm hoping that'll come down. We have another meeting uh, in March. We're going to do a second look, as we always do. Um, I'm going to say nine out of 10 years, it's always less. I mean, short of a couple of catastrophic illnesses, I mean, it, it typically is always less because our trending analysis is less. That's our salaries by classification. If you're just wondering how it, how it looks in the district, I mean, the vast majority, you know, is, is the teachers contract uh, the teachers. We have 319 uh, teachers uh, followed up by, I can't even read my administration, and then the various categories thereafter. Hey, Mark. Yes. I swear I asked this last year and I just don't remember the answer. I'm sorry. What is confidential slash manager? We have several different breakouts of our administrative assistance. We have three defined confidential uh, administrative assistants. Mm -hmm. um, they are the superintendent's secretary. They are Dr. Barber's administrative assistant and mine. And they are defined by the Pennsylvania Labor Relations Board as confidential. We had that when actually our support staff unionized and the Pennsylvania Labor Relations Board identified those three key positions as confidential. So they're defined differently by virtue of that action years ago. Uh, and then we have a couple managers that really aren't included in our administrative position. We have Tom Jenkins is one of them. We have Mark Fisher, who is one of them. Um, I think there's Nikki Laws is in that category now. So we have managers and confidentials lumped into one. There's really very little differentiating benefits from top to bottom. We all enjoy the same level of health care benefits. We all enjoy the same level of prescription uh, benefits. So there's very little, I would say, disparity between the groups as far as mm -hmm. the benefits go but they are classified in different ways. And I'm still trying to wrap my head around it. Um, so that's different than the, the Act 93 bucket and the non-Act 1 bucket. And right. This is a different bucket. And yes, we, okay. we really have the, we, we have a couple different classifications. I always go, the teachers have their collective bargaining. Group. Right. The individual employment contracts, and there's the three of us that have those, they're negotiated 
you know, through the board or through a board mm -hmm. designee. Uh, and then we have Act 93 by law is a meet and discuss. The board does have a compensation and benefits package that it has approved in the past multi-year. Um, so those, those, those categories. And then we get down to sort of the unrepresented categories by association. So that's your 12-month administrative assistance, your confidential and manager groups. We had 11 months, we had 10 months, and we have the custodial mm -hmm. maintenance department. So all those categories are sort of defined within our HR department, but not by any type of statute. So if you wanted to say, okay. just group them all together, totally legal. We just don't, we break them out separately. They're separate color on the pie chart. Yes. Thank you. Are we still doing 10 and 11 months? We got rid of the 10 month position. Yeah, I thought so. we got rid of one of them, right? So it's just the 11s and the 12s. So we have a couple that we, I think, are just grandfathering right now. We'll move those to eventually 12 months. Okay. Um, so it was, it was the 10 I was thinking of. Okay. Yes. All right, taking a look at benefits, um, I think we've covered many of these items. Um, the bottom end happens to be the self-insured benefits and the top are fully insured products. So we're fully insured, meaning we just pay a premium regardless of the experience for life insurance, um, income protection, vision, social security, retirement are percentages of salary. So as salary increases, those two categories are going to increase. Um, tuition reimbursement, once again, that's a, a mostly paid out to our professional staff. We're currently in negotiations. Uh, but this number is based on a historical trend for paying out tuition for employees that are partaking in that endeavor. Uh, unemployment comp, we have very low unemployment, as you can imagine, for our district. We're not typically doing many furloughs and layoffs. Uh, as I mentioned, workers' comp, we're self-insured, and the big ones are medical prescription and dental at the bottom. Other increases, I mean, some of them are redundant as we break it down, but, you know, we have the uh, board certified behavioral health analyst. We have legal fees. I mentioned the purchase property services or capital improvements that is in the facilities department and our charter school reduction. This is just breaking it right down the categories. Just talk a little bit about um, our retirement system, as I mentioned, it was mandatory. Um, you can see that the projections, which we just got in, uh, really in January, uh, they certified the rate in December. Uh, we are reaching sort of the, the pinnacle of it, which is, which is good news. The bad news is that 35, 36% continues on for years, actually so far off that I can't chart it at this point. Um, so there is an unfunded liability that our new employees, although are differentiated, for their benefit, the district is charged the same. And I, I think that's an important distinction because really what's happening is their benefit is less, but the district is paying now a composite rate. There's those individuals that are typically more senior involved in the system that have a higher benefit rate. And then there's been two changes to our retirement system. So the newbies coming in are receiving a significant lesser benefit. However, the district just pays one rate. All right, so that 35%, regardless of what their benefit is, is paying the same. In theory, that is reducing your rate. All right, so if they broke out the two rates, you'd be paying one that would probably be at 40% and one that may be at 5%. So this is a composite rate based upon three different retirement, all within the same system, but just driving different benefits for their employees. So we're at 35.3%. That will not change. Yeah, that's certified. Mr. Kramer? Yeah. Right, there's been a lot of press. I know I get emails and forwards from a, a lot of conversations about not only the uh, FBI investigation with PCERS, but also their investment strategies and the properties that they've owned and less than average return on investments. So a lot of that has been ongoing. All right, this is charter schools. And just taking a look, this is based upon this current year. Uh, our regular education tuition rate of 14.5 thousand and our special ed rate of 32.5. Um, some large dollars, but 
it uses a PDE formula and it, and it really pulls account codes out of our budget. So we receive a one page 363 PDE form and we put budget line in for this, budget line in for this. They have all the information, but we have to go through the exercise anyway. So does every district in the Commonwealth that's a public school. It drives different tuition rates for every district. Districts that are spending less overall per student are going to have lower tuition rates. So the charter school is receiving a different rate for each student that comes from different schools. So, I mean, Avangrove Charter School pulls from Avangrove, Oxford, Kennett, Coatesville, and Octorare. They're all sending kids there, all receiving the same level of instruction, but everybody's paying different rates for the kids to go there. All right, and ours is the same regardless of whether they go to a brick and mortar like Avangrove or go to a cyber charter school. So the rates are the same. And this is something that as school board members, especially those involved with policy, that there's a lot of advocacy on both sides. One is say, these rates are unfair because we're paying 32.5 for a child that was identified as special education, but the districts that's paying that has absolutely no right to challenge the educational services being provided for that. So it could be that they're receiving speech or OT or PT services versus another child who's receiving you know, a much greater breadth of services, uh, but that rate's the same. So there's, there's no correlation of one of the biggest artists. There's no correlation to the services that those students are receiving in charter school and the tuition rate that's being paid, right? There's just, there's no accountability. They'll say, well, they're under different regulations and they are, um, but these are the rates we're paying. Uh, as our budget increases, these rates will go up, All right? So. I have a question. Sure. How many students do we have that will pay to school? Yeah, well, right now, I think we have about 120 some students at Avangrove Charter School, and probably about another 40, I think. I don't know if it's in here. Oh, I have it up on the screen. 135 and 31. But it, it changes. I mean, every month we're getting, you know, there, there's always withdrawals and there's always enrollments going on. So, so we watch it, we pay the bills every month, um, and then there's end of year reconciliations because we don't catch it all. So it, it's, I think we have now, I'm gonna say at least 10 cyber charter schools and we only have the one brick and mortar, which is Avangrove. We used to have, there was one in um, Oxford for a, a while. That was a brick and mortar. And for a while we were busing kids to, not busing them because we're outside 10 miles, but Collegium. So we had a couple of our residents who worked at Collegium or dropped off their kids there, but they weren't getting transportation, but we did pay the rate for them. There's also no correlation between that 14.5 and what the actual we say you're, you're, we're not teaching a student, but you, you pull one kid out of a class of, of 20 and we're still you know, heating the buildings, providing all the services. It's not saving us, you know, fourteen point five thousand dollars because that one student is not there. So there's no, no actual correlation between what's being sent to another school while we still have all the overhead we're covering here. The good news is we are sending less kids to charter schools. I mean, Avangrove Charter School at one time had upwards of 200. We might have crested 200 for a little bit. So th th it's a, a good indication that this number is down, that parents are trusting their education, you know, connect to their education for their kids. So I look at it as positive. You know, there is, there's probably a smaller uh, homeschooling unit now because they can get curriculum and resources by enrolling in a cyber charter school. Um, you know, it's one of those areas I think that as, as we continue on with some of our, our marketing strategies that certainly we can identify, and remarket these individuals that choose to educate their kids in other settings. No, private schools, parochial schools, they receive transportation rights, but they receive no tuition with that child. Not if it's a private school. We have private placements, but the board will actually approve those private placements or the district will actually assign it. So there are private institutions that we have kids educated in, but they're typically through contracts that are approved by the board. You may see one coming up in the next month, but in executive session, you know, we'll present private placements to, to the board. Uh, but for the most part, you know, private schools, parochial schools receive nothing other than transportation services. All right, taking a look at revenues, and we do back in. We build the budget sort of backwards. We look at all the expenses from ground zero and build all the various components, and we're introducing that to the Finance Committee from September through January. Once we know and have identified all of our expenses, we start to look at the revenue side. 
the last number we plug is actually how much local revenue do we need? It is the one area that we have discretion to balance the budget. So that is the last aspect is to look at what tax rate do we need to set to match those revenue sources with expenditures. We're going to talk, we'll talk a little bit about the state. And as I mentioned, we don't know really what the state sources will be for next year. The budget will come out within the next month. Um, we will present that in March. It, it won't surprise me. I mean, we're going to be, there, there will be increases. I, I can pretty much assure you there will be increases in these items. It's just going to be how much of those increases does the board feel comfortable putting into the budget because the state has a horrible track record of approving budgets before this school board will act on its final budget. So this is our revenue piece broken down by the various categories. Uh, you can see um, if you looked at school districts, uh, I don't want to pick on anybody, but typically, you know, you look at Coastal, their state sources are going to be much larger. Uh, there's some schools that are funded almost at 50% or more. So if you get into inner city like the Harrisburgs, you're going to see even larger numbers being funded state. So we do have a lot of control over our sources that they're local here. Um, federal, just uh, the federal programs are always one of those catchy. I mean, it's necessary to run a lot of our programs: Title One, Title Two, II, Title Three, II, Title Four. We have some ESSERS money now coming in. These are some of the COVID Act relief, pandemic relief. Um, but they're necessary to provide our programs the continuity of moving forward. And I, I don't want to take it for granted because if that million dollars goes away, we've, we're, we're caught in a situation of cutting programs or funding them locally. All right, so th there's a lot of work that comes with it. There are restricted grants, I mean, there's targeted initiatives, audiences that, and criteria that they have to meet. So it's not as free as the money that we raise or receive from the state. I did break out the Social Security and PSERS just to show you that because for years, as that PSERS chart was going up, the state had to fund 50% of our expense. So we're over here crying foul with our million dollars, and they're giving us half a million back. So the state was preaching, we're giving more and more dollars to fund public education. But if I would show you this chart over the last decade, it was all funding the mandated retirement system. There's been very small, almost this very incremental growth in our main funding streams, which used to provide us with educational resources. And that's the basic ed and special education components. But as we were trying to deal with the PCERS increases coming at us, they were as well. So, I mean, there was years and years of budget where we're getting hold harmless on basic, which means no increase, hold harmless on special ed, and yet we were still receiving an extra million dollars in state subsidy, but was only getting back what we paid. And this is what it looks like in percent. So as you go out to your constituency, 78% is funded locally. And we're gonna just take a look at where that comes from, but we are very dependent upon our community to support our school district. All right, there's all the state numbers. As I mentioned, basic ed, we typically get some type of inflationary increase in basic ed. So I think you'll see that number coming in at this 3 4% this year, which will be significant to us. Um, special education is a, a formula that is based upon the number of total students that we have. It's going to start catching up our declining enrollment. So even though they're going to give increases, we may actually start seeing some decreases in these light ends because they use a weighted average membership. And our weighted average membership is going to start decreasing. So unless we receive an increase that will overcome that, we may start seeing some decreases in some of our state funding, even though they're funding more on a per student basis. So it, it, you know, this, this may be one of the first years that we see we're down about 200 kids over the last three years. Transportation study uh, subsidy we did pull down last year. Uh, we're busing less kids. It's going to be horrendous next year because we've done so many consolidations of runs this past year. You know, loading up buses to capacity, doubling up runs. We're saving a lot of money in that line item on the expense side. You know, and you'll see that when we close out the year, we're saving it on fuel as well for the buses because we buy our, our own unleaded uh, diesel fuel. But what you're doing is now it's going to translate to reductions in state subsidy for transportation. There's some other small ones, the rental and sinking fund. That's a terrible terminology. You heard George mention that we get pennies back on the dollar. So in our $7 million that we're paying right now on the debt for all the capital improvements, the middle school, high school renovations from years ago, 
that's what we get back on seven million. So we're getting about half a million dollars back on seven million dollars that we spend. Health services, we do get a small amount of money back for providing health services uh, through our nurses in our buildings. It's for dental health screening, so we do get a little kickback for that. Property tax reduction, I just want to highlight that 1.4 comes in the budget and immediately goes back out. So that 1.4, if you look at your tax notification that you receive, there's a homestead farmstead exclusion. If it is your primary domicile, you're going to get about 230 buck credit on your bill. All those 200, it doesn't matter how the value of your property, it's the same for every property. So if you add up our 6,600 residential properties that qualify at 230, it's going to equal 1.4 million. You know, so we'll go through that. There's a very long resolution that you're going to approve in June. And all it does is basically take how many properties have qualified. And they, they, they qualify through the county. There's an open enrollment period for Homestead Farmstead. We don't make residents sign up every time. If you signed up once, you're in for life unless you sell. But all that $230 equals the state allocation. So this is part of when gambling came to PA. It really hasn't fluctuated a whole bunch. You know, even though gambling has increased and, and you know, table games have come in, this number has basically stayed static almost since day one. So I wouldn't expect it to change a whole bunch. Um, and that really is just a wash. So if it comes in at 1.2, we're going to give out 1.2. We'll know this. It's part of your budget timeline. We'll get that exact dollar that the district's going to get so we know how to calculate that percentage homestead farmstead reduction on your tax bill. We have a couple other things that uh, real quickly ready to learn block grant that 400,000 has been in the line item now for years that jump started us from going from half day kindergarten to full day kindergarten. It continues to get funded. They've tried to roll in the basic ed and it keeps getting bounced back out for some reason up at the state. But when we we have to qualify through an application every year, it funds our full day kindergarten. Without it, we'd be looking at pulling that back to at least some type of modified half-day, full-day program or funding it locally. But that's where all 400000 goes. I uh, mentioned before, Social Security and retirement mandated. We already mentioned about both the whole special education, basic ed. Um, we're just waiting for the budget approval. Let's skip down to the next page. Hey, Mark, before you go on, can you go back a couple of slides? I just want to make sure as I'm following this, state revenue on PCERS, is that basically like a match? Is that like a 50%? Am I, am I, that am is I, am I seeing the numbers right? Yeah, okay. yeah so, so if they you, cover, if you went to the budget, we're roughly 50%. That's our big ticket number, and they cover half. Okay, yep, got it. That's Thanks. correct, right? <clears throat> Yeah, that and Social Security, we get back half of what we pay in. So that's what Mark was saying, that in the years where there was no increase in the education subsidies, that they were saying we were getting an increase is because we were paying more in and getting 50% of that back. So a little smoke and mirrors. Yeah, and that number will fluctuate as we add positions, delete positions, take into account some retirements, very small numbers at this point, but it will fluctuate. What has been said is that 35% rate is now locked in for next year. All right, moving on to our local revenues, um, it does drive our budget. The very top line item is our real estate taxes, uh, by far the largest item in our revenue section of the budget. Uh, that is based upon the proposed tax increase of 2%. And you can see that we're driving out $2.8 million of new revenue through that line item. Um, I'm just going to skip ahead real quick while I talk about that because uh, let's go. There it is. Okay, if you look at this, there's two components of where that $2.8 million new money came in. One is the proposed tax increase. The other one was that gross growth in assessment that we talked about several months ago. I think that everybody has seen new townhome communities come online, some commercial properties come online. Everything that is added to our community is tax. Residential properties, industrial properties, commercial properties. It's all taxed with the exception, you know, there's a couple, you know, churches, utilities, railroads, there's a couple things that are, are exempted. But if you see a debt going on a property, they're receiving an increase in their tax. Anybody has to go through a building permit triggers the process of the county coming out and doing an assessment review. So we've been very fortunate over the year, and we showed a schedule where for years, you know, we didn't see any growth 
and suddenly it was like 300,000, 400, and this year 1.5 million. So districts that are receiving significant growth, I'm going to, you know, kind of point out Downingtown. They didn't have tax increases for multiple years, but anybody that drove through Downingtown saw some of the massive communities that were coming online. That was funding huge growth in their local revenue. And we enjoyed that here early on in the 2000s. So when Bayer States was coming online and Hartfeld and Candlewick, when those communities were coming online, they were funding all of our increases without really raising taxes in many cases. So the bulk of it is coming through that mechanism right now. Um, we'll touch on interim taxes, and you'll hear me say this over. Interim taxes, anything we don't bill out July 1st. So let's use that deck for example again. If someone builds a deck in September, well, they didn't get billed in July for that. The county will go out and assess it. We'll get notified of an assessment of a $1,000 change, and we'll bill that mid-year. So all of those, all these houses that are coming online, all the um, Longwood Preserve houses that are coming online right now, we're receiving multiple new assessments, and we're billing them, and they're active to the effective date of that house. So that is what is occurring. And then we got some big ones. I mean, they're not just small houses. We had the flats come in this last year. I mean, the flats was uh, you know north of $400,000 tax bill that went out mid-year. So when you look at this year's, what I had budgeted to actual, it's significantly off because we had one taxpayer end up paying 400000 for a tax bill. So that's what interim taxes are. Anything out of that July 1st billing cycle is going out as an interim tax bill. So if there's lots of development coming December, January, February, we're going to do well in that category. Um, looking at earned income tax, really, which is, is next, uh, we do implement an earned income tax for, for all residential homeowners, uh, 0.5. We, our actual tax resolution is for the full 1%. All right, so East Marlboro, for example, you know, we're entitled to individuals who reside in East Marlboro, we're collecting 1% on it because East Marlboro Township does not implement an earned income tax. So if you live out near Schoolhouse Lane in East Marlboro, you're paying 1%, all right? If you live in the borough, we split that. So if somebody's, you're still paying 1%, but a borough resident is seeing half of that go to the school district, half go to the municipality. All right, and some of you are probably thinking, wait, mine's over 1%. Yes, that's true because New Garden and Kennett Township have imposed some other additional taxes, clean and green, emergency services tax that allow them to go over the 1%. The district is held at that half a percent. So this is what that half a percent generates over the course of the year to us. Mark? Yes. Does this number, well, I, I know in this calendar year we saw, or in this fiscal year, we, we saw an increased EIT revenue based on the fact that people were working remotely, working from home more than they did previously due to COVID. Do you expect that to continue? In the future, how, how, how's that impacting? No, it's a, it's a great question. Uh, it was twofold. One is we received estimates from Keystone Collection, which collects the earned income tax for the entire county. Uh, they had projected that the pandemic would significantly reduce the overall earnings for not only our district, but pretty much countywide by you know a pretty good margin. We received estimates. We reduced our budget by, I think, 700000 And then we watched as individuals were still gainfully employed for the most part, working out of their houses. Some of it, then the Philadelphia wage earners suddenly pulled back, and after six months, we can claim them as local, not getting it through the sterling tax credit. So we did see areas of growth in, in a time when we still had a higher level of unemployment. So yes, to your question, there, there's this interesting dynamic We'll get projections again. We haven't received them yet for next year. But overall, um, the county is doing significantly well. Um, you know, we awarded our second contract uh, to Keystone Collection Group. Um, you know, they really are good at auditing. So, you know, they have to wait for the states two years behind. So if someone, you know, doesn't pay their local earned income tax, it takes us two years to identify that individual. But then we aggressively pursue that. You know, because we're waiting until they'll do a state match and say, okay, who paid the state that didn't pay us and yet has identified? You put that little school code when you're filling out your state tax form, that's actually helping us reconcile two years in arrears. So we're going after that. But 
Uh, I sit on the board for the um, Chester County Tax Collection Committee, and uh, it, they, they have done an outstanding job, Keystone Collection Group, and we'll get new estimates, but it is an interesting thing that we claim less sterling tax credit. So we do get money back for the Philadelphia wage earners, uh, but it was significantly down. And it's that dynamic, individuals working from home. Yep. Uh, earnings from investments, still rock bottom. I mean, you know, for a while there, we really had hope. You know, these categories uh, were over a million years ago. Um, and here we are, you know, looking at investing probably at our max, just shy of 80 million uh, in, in the bank, and, and we're getting fractions. We are very limited uh, in our investment vehicles that it's under Act 72 of the school code. Uh, they have they have loosened that a little bit that does allow us to get into a little bit of, uh, of the stock market, but you got to be very careful because no one on this board nor myself would be rewarded for that 0.01% growth increase. But if you lose any bit of that principal, you know, you have, a, you have a very high fiduciary responsibility to your taxpayer. So, you know, they were doing interest rate swaps for a while. In the derivatives market, we met with Chatham Financial uh, because that is the name of their game. Uh, Mike Bontrager group sat down and said, it's just a too risky of an investment to be the custodial public funds and, and play that type of hedge game. Uh, so we have complied with Act 72. We do invest in collateralized pools, but everything is guaranteeing that principle. So, you know, at no point in time is any of the district's money at risk. And 100% of our money is always invested. We sweep all of our local accounts. So we make deposits. We sweep them overnight and put them into investment trust. But there's just nothing out there. Actually, they're starting to charge fees like your traditional bank because they're losing money on our money. You know, it's either that or charge negative interest. Um, it's an interesting dynamic. But I think with some of the inflationary indexes, we'll start to see this increase. However, we are just taking a beating again on our interest income. This chart just shows you when Act 1 was implemented back in 2006, it took to 2008 until the districts really started to have to identify with it. But we had long-term contracts. You, you were into a teacher's contract, busing contracts, things that you just couldn't easily work your way out of, commitments on the district's behalf. And then suddenly it said, well, there's a ceiling to your taxes. Um, so you can see it's taken us a little bit of time to, to work within Act 1. But over the years now, I mean, I really think that you see that, that we've done you know, an exemplar job of working within Act 1, knowing that that's the benchmark for what we're going to be measured. Not that a zero tax increase isn't preferred always, but you're going to have inflationary indexes uh, that we have to deal with, and we've been able to modify our spending criteria under Act 1 um, and still experience growth, I think, you know, in, in academic programs and opportunities for our kids, renovating our facilities and the like, but that's just a comparison of where we're at and no different this year coming out with the preliminary proposed tax increase under the Act 1 index. And that's just a, a recap page uh, we've gone over. Uh, we'll continue to scrutinize uh, the expenses and the revenues and, and bring you with updates each and every finance committee meeting. Uh, certainly if there's things that uh, Dr. Blakey identifies a, an initiative that wasn't on the map, um, then we're going to need to address that as well, uh, whether it's staffing shortages, the collective bargaining agreement, as I mentioned. So there are some unknowns at this time, but I think you can understand that we're five months out from a final passage, and we'll really try to hone those in each month, bringing you closer and closer to a, a, a budget that this board can approve. Uh, with that, I know I've, I think I went about an hour and a half straight of speaking. Uh, if you have any questions, please feel free to ask them now or email me. And again, yes. if you have um, some subject matters you want to deep dive into in some of those further um, finance committee meetings, uh, let us know. I just wanted to bring up that, and I had this conversation with Dr. Blakey recently, that um, much like you mentioned with the federal grants, that you know if those grants go away, we'd have to cut the program or, or, or absorb it into the budget. And they're, the ESSERS fund, which we're very fortunate in having them for the next at least two years, that whatever personnel or programs are being funded by that, we have to be aware that when they do go away, that we either have to um, curtail them or, or absorb them into the budget as well. So we have to keep an eye on those things. So any other questions out there? And uh, I guess, Penny, if you're like watching us on your birthday, happy birthday, but I'm sure you're not. <laughs> she is watching us. Oh, okay. Well, happy birthday, Penny. All right, great. So we are adjourned. <laughs>